Okay, picture this. You're a struggling video game company in the late 2000s who wants to make your version of Red Dawn. The problem is you need to find a communist superpower to invade America, but the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. So what do you do? What communist country is still making headlines that you might, just might, be able to turn them into a credible threat for your first-person shooter? Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian. So, let's talk about Homefront. Homefront is a 2011 video game developed by Chaos Studios and published by THQ, both of which have since gone out of business. It's a relatively short game, as the story mode is less than three hours long, so if you're good at video games, you can probably finish it in a day. In it, you play as a resistant fighter, attempting to strike back at the communist nation that is occupying all of America west of the Mississippi. That nation being... North Korea. Okay, to be fair, it's not the same North Korea from our timeline, but more on that later. If Homefront seems inspired by 1984's Red Dawn, well, that's intentional. In fact, John Milius, the writer-director of Red Dawn, was involved in creating the story, although there was some controversy in whether he wrote any of it, was just a story consultant, or if the game developers just wanted to use his name for marketing purposes. He also co-authored the Italian novel Homefront The Voice of Freedom with Raymond Benson, but again, not sure how involved he was in that either. Also, side note, but Johnny Boy here is quite the character, to put it mildly. He is a self-described right-wing extremist who, in an interview with Reason magazine, once said about General Douglas MacArthur that, and I quote, It might not have been bad for this country if he crossed the Mississippi like Caesar crossed the Rubicon and proclaimed himself Emperor Douglas I. <laughs> oh, Johnny. I mean, maybe he was kidding, but you could see that Homefront is meant to appeal to the conservative, flag-waving, commie-hating Americans that still make up a large part of the game-buying public, and the internet for that matter. As you can imagine, Homefront also relies on myths about the American Revolution in its storytelling, as in the rebels were just civilians armed only with hunting rifles and their wits who successfully waged a guerrilla war against a much larger empire. In reality, things were more complicated. American generals like George Washington showed disdain for the militia, even if it was unwarranted at times. More importantly, myths like this ignore how vital a well-trained standing army, with support from the French, was in defeating the British. Anywho, all this meant Homefront received a lot of criticism when it launched. Aiden Foster Carter, while writing for 38 North, gave a pretty scathing commentary on it, saying, This sounds like a deeply implausible and lurid, not to say rancid, fantasy of sick, paranoid minds who know nothing of real Korean or world politics. Yikes. Now, cards on the table, I didn't play Homefront myself. I'm not any good at video games, and I really don't have the time to learn, so instead I watched a playthrough of it by YouTuber... NK Ice and Fire, so thanks for posting that, buddy. <laughs> uh, and anywho, from that perspective, the game seemed... fine? The gun battles are intense and trying to avoid spoilers, but the storytelling wasn't terrible either. Graphics also seemed okay for a 2011 game. Plus, I thought Homefront did a good job showing the human cost of war. The story takes time to focus on the suffering of civilians in North Korean-occupied America, which is not something most video games do, many of which unintentionally glorify war by making you an unstoppable action hero. Granted, I personally felt Homefront went too far at times, but I got a lot of flack for saying this on Twitter, and I don't feel like kicking that particular hornet's nest again. Just be warned that Homefront is a dark game. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's learn about the alternate history of Homefront. Well, for starters, Homefront is a future history, which is a related genre to alternate history, but as the name suggests, it's uh, more forward-looking. Nevertheless, since most of the defining events in the Homefront timeline already happen or will happen very soon, I think we can treat it as an honorary alternate history. With that said, Homefront is set in 2027, with the important story events happening after 2011. Shockingly, Homefront comes out swinging with their prediction that the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, would die on January 2nd, 2012, and be succeeded by his son, Kim Jong-un, which did happen in our timeline just 16 days before Homefront predicted he'd die. Unfortunately, we follow the Price is Right rules here on the Alternate Historian, so Homefront gets nothing. Granted, the original actor Homefront cast as Kim Jong-un was not as, uh, husky as our timeline's version, which meant they had to recast him. Anywho, Kim Jong-un stuns the world by immediately calling for a formal peace treaty between North and South Korea. Now, in our timeline, the two countries had been in a state of war since 1953, but alternate Kim Jong-un somehow managed to fix this in almost no time at all, and by 2013, the two Koreas had been united into the Greater Korean Republic. 
Like, I'm sorry, but this doesn't make any sense to me. In home front, South Korea just seems to meekly give in as soon as North Korea asks pretty pleas for peace, and afterwards just lets them dictate their future relationship. In reality, South Korea has more to lose by taking on the poverty-stricken North, which can barely provide electricity to its populace. South Korea is the one with powerful allies and connections to the global economy. The only thing the North brings to the table is the promise to not nuke Seoul. To be fair, most people didn't know anything about Kim Jong-un when Homefront was being developed, but to treat him as some sort of Lex Luthor-esque evil super genius who's able to easily bamboozle the South Koreans, that's just silly. Meanwhile, while things are going better in Korea, an economic downturn begins to affect much of the world, especially in the United States where people are finding consumer goods increasingly expensive and hard to come by. In order to cut costs, America ends its military commitments in places like Iraq and East Asia, while decreasing the military's budget overall. To make matters worse, Iran and Saudi Arabia, both now nuclear powers, go to war in 2015, causing prices to skyrocket. An unusually cold winter in 2016 led many Americans in the northern states to flee south due to the fact they couldn't afford to keep their homes warm, leading to the southern states closing their borders to these refugees. By 2017, the collapsing American economy and infrastructure has led to martial law being declared. While things suck in America, the young Greater Korean Republic continues to rise. In 2015, Kim Jong-un was elected president of the GKR in a landslide, although the game does cast doubt on how free these elections were. Meanwhile, the GKR gets to prove they are now a world power when in 2018, due to ethnic cleansing of Koreans in Japan after a failed assassination of the Japanese royal family, Korea declares war on Japan and quickly occupies and then annexes the country in an ironic parallel of Japan's annexation of Korea roughly 100 years earlier. As the 2020s roll around, the Greater Korean Republic continues to expand. The GKR allies itself with Iran, who presumably won their war with Saudi Arabia, which gives them access to more oil. Meanwhile, most of Southeast Asia joins up with Korea under the banner of the Pan-Asian Alliance, somehow. I mean, the alliance seems like Japan's Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, the World War II era block of East Asian puppet nations and colonies that was supposed to make Japan less dependent on goods from Europe and America. But various home front commercials say the Greater Korean Republic enacts these nations directly. Regardless of what happened, it's odd that no one, not even the people living in those countries, seems opposed to it. There are no boycotts, protests, rebellions, etc. Everyone is just cool with the Kim family telling them what to do now. Moving on, Korea's military reaches 25 million members by 2023, and is one of the most sophisticated and advanced forces in the world being deployed in conflict zones as far as Africa. Somehow. As for America, well, in 2021, a global pandemic known as the Knoxville cough broke out and holy crap, another good guess by Homefront. Anywho, America finds itself increasingly isolated from the rest of the world because of this. The federal government also breaks down as the states fight amongst themselves. And then, in 2025, Korea invades America. Why? I don't know. Homefront doesn't go into the details regarding the greater Korean Republic's motivations. There are vague suggestions of needing resources or wanting revenge, but when you are already a superpower whose influence is felt on almost every continent, why start an expensive ground invasion against a large country on the other side of the Pacific Ocean? What resources do you still need? Was there no way to bully America into becoming a client state of the GKR? Like the entire timeline of Homefront shows America falling apart at the seams. So couldn't the GKR dangle aid in exchange for an incredibly lopsided trade deal that turned America into a banana republic? Doesn't that give them America's resources and even the satisfaction of bringing America low without wasting a single Korean life? Look, all I'm saying is I'm a better evil genius than this alternate Kim Jong-un. Anywho, the invasion begins when Korea detonates an EMP over America, which shuts down the American power grid. And according to today I found out, this is a real threat. Nuclear weapons detonated in high altitude can cause major disruptions to a nation's electronic infrastructure. And there are non-nuclear options as well. Plus the aftermath would be disastrous, with one estimate suggesting it take 4 to 10 years, yes you heard me, years, to fix. Nevertheless, an EMP probably wouldn't be as effective as Homefront makes it, since the U.S. has taken precautions to protect their military equipment from EMPs. So even with the budget cuts, the U.S. military should be in relatively one piece by the time of the invasion. But Homefront does counter this by including references to America using Korean microchips and their civil and military computers that have backdoors planted in them by the Greater Korean Republic. 
Thus, taking advantage of this digital Achilles heel, Korean troops are able to land in large numbers on the west coast, having built up their transportation capacity by seizing a bunch of unused cargo carriers. That said, I don't know if they have the surface fleet to protect them, but whatever. Soon the Koreans, with their nearly unstoppable tank drones and automated turrets, occupy everything west of the Mississippi River, which they irradiate to make transportation across it deadly, which is similar to MacArthur's plan to irradiate the Yalu River to prevent anyone attacking the Korean Peninsula from the north. Moving right along, by 2027, the Occupied America has been organized into the new Korean Federation of Occupied America, and things are bad there. Basic goods and services are hard to come by. Many Americans are forced to work in disease-ridden labor camps, while any resistance to the regime is quashed with excessive violence. There are few sanctuaries, and survivalists in rural areas are sometimes even worse than the Koreans as they live out their deranged Mad Max fantasies of both the Korean occupiers and their fellow Americans. Nevertheless, there is an organized resistance trying to end the occupation, and Homefront proper begins when you, playing as the mute character Robert Jacobs, are rescued by the resistance to help them in their plan to liberate San Francisco. And I'll stop right there so I don't end up spoiling the rest of Homefront's story. But now that we know the timeline, is it plausible? Well, I gotta give credit to Homefront's creators in their world building for at least attempting to upgrade North Korea and downgrade America enough to make this even remotely possible. One of the people who worked on Homefront is Tai Kim, a former CIA agent and story consultant. In an interview he did with Game Reactor, Tai said, When the game was first announced, everybody said, Are you sure picking North Korea? At the same time, we went to a very rigorous academic research process to make sure to not only look at North Korea's current state, but to look at historical examples how things could parallel in turn events. History repeats itself, from today to the day the evasion starts in the game. If you combine everything, the odds are very, very slim this becomes true. But when you look at the storyline step by step, every step is a coin flip, but a plausible step. So once you get there, it's plausible. And from there, the next step is plausible as well, even though the whole thing is fictional. It comes with plausible baby steps. Also, as 8-Bit Brian pointed out in his breakdown of the Homefront timeline for Destructoid, Homefront's creators may have been trying to parallel the history of South Korea in regards to how they portrayed occupied America in the game. This is not a bad idea because, and excuse me while I simplify about 70-ish years of history, but when the Korean Peninsula was taken from Japan at the end of World War II, the southern half came under American control and was organized into Republic of Korea, aka South Korea. Despite being on the side of the capitalist democracies, South Korea spent most of its history under corrupt and inefficient dictatorships. Inflation and poverty were rampant, elections were shams, and the citizens had few rights, and anyone opposed to the regime, whether they were communist or not, could be jailed or killed. Often the only reason South Korea kept going was because of financial aid from America, which cared little about what was going on, just as long as everyone kept on hating those commies. Hmm, <laughs> power for the course with Cold War America, actually. In fact, this made the Democratic People's Republic of Korea aka North Korea, more appealing to many South Koreans, despite being a communist dictatorship, because they were relatively better off than the South. Of course, this situation didn't last long. By the end of the Cold War, democracy finally took hold in South Korea, and the economy improved significantly. Meanwhile, North Korea, having lost an ally in the Soviet Union, found itself with few friends. Their isolationist policies and nuclear program cut them off even further, which increased the suffering of your average North Korean. So, okay, yeah, maybe I can see some parallels with South Korean history. I'm just not sure if it's intentional. Homefront never really talks about South Korean history, and given how South Koreans were treated in the game, I'm not sure if the game developers had all that much respect for them. And this is where I stop saying nice things about Homefront, because to be frank, a lot of the events of this timeline seem contrived. For example, why is the Greater Korean Republic immune to the collapsing global economy, the energy crisis, or the Knoxville cough? These are all worldwide events that are bringing down countries like America, but Korea seems immune to it. Sure, the North Korea of our timeline might be able to ride these things out due to their isolation, but the GKR is a global superpower participating with the rest of the international community. This should be hurting too, but nevertheless able to launch an invasion of America. And why is no other nation in the world stopping the expansion of the Greater Korean Republic? Even with all the global crises happening in the home front timeline, it's hard to believe that absolutely everyone would just let the GKR expand across East Asia. One only has to look at how the global community responds to threats in places like Ukraine or Taiwan to know that Uber North Korea probably shouldn't have gotten away with invading Japan, much less gobbling up chunks of Asia. And yet, no one seems to care. I don't know, I feel like we're missing something here. Like, isn't there like this really big country next to North Korea? Like, it has a huge population, a very large military, nuclear weapons, and they might have an issue with being surrounded by a Korean superpower. 
I'm of course talking about China, which I haven't mentioned until now because the game doesn't mention them either. Oh, there are some references to them suffering a bit due to economic woes, but otherwise they are just sort of there. Neither they or Taiwan, for that matter, end up getting annexed by the Greater Korean Republic or join the Pan-Asian Alliance. They don't protest or try to stop the GKR when they start expanding across their southern border, nor do they seem to care when the GKR picks a fight with a nuclear-armed America. Hmm, come to think of it, China is a major power with an expanding global influence. They would have been the perfect bad guys for a home front. Why weren't they chosen? Well, for the most cynical reason possible money. You see, China was meant to be the bad guys of Homefront. In fact, you can see evidence of this in how the Greater Korean Republic's weaponry and equipment are Chinese in origin, but with different names. But in our timeline, China is a major market and its communist government doesn't like any criticism, so in fear of losing business, changes are made to Homefront's story. In order to be essentially politically correct, North Korea became the baddies because no one except the most deluded tanky will defend them and they are usually in the news for threatening to nuke America for some reason or another. So it was hoped that gamers, who aren't exactly known for being foreign policy gurus, would find the premise believable enough that they would buy the shooty shooty bang bang game. Unfortunately, dropping China as the villain didn't help. Homefront got mixed reviews, but it sold well enough that it did eventually get a sequel under new developers. Homefront The Revolution is set in a different timeline where an alternate history North Korea occupies half of America, except this time it's the eastern half because why not drop any attempts at plausibility at this point? And yet, if I'm being completely honest, Homefront isn't the worst alternate history I've ever seen. Believe me, I've seen some pretty bad ones. But nevertheless, its timeline is a mess. In a way, Homefront reminds me of the Draco books by S.M. Sterling. I mean, both timelines involve an anti-American superpower that had humble beginnings, but still expanded across continents, without anyone making any real attempts to stop them, all the while developing advanced technologies and capabilities with few, if any, setbacks. Except with the Draco, Sterling at least gave a couple of centuries of historical changes to make them work, even if the concept of the super slaver empire is a tad silly. With Homefront, however, the Greater Korean Republic gets at most 15 years, which strains my suspension of disbelief and makes it a bad alternate history wink. Of course, it's easy to criticize something, but harder to create it yourself. So, let's imagine for a second that we exist in a timeline when Homefront wasn't made until today, and I was chosen as store consultant. Here'd be my pitch. I'd recommend doing a realistic Second Korean War, because my readings of multiple speculations about what that would actually be like is pretty frightening. Now, how to start the war? I'm not sure. Despite all of the political tension, no American president has ever seriously considered a regime change, and while North Korea is a nutty absolute monarchy cosplaying as a communist utopia, the Kims aren't stupid or else they would have marched their army south years ago. So I think the best way to start the war is by accident. Some misunderstanding during heightened tensions or one of the frequent clashes at the DMZ just escalates and boom, a full-blown war erupts that South Korea and America are unprepared for. In fact, this is how the war with North Korea was started in the 2018 Jeffrey Lewis novel, The 2020 Commission Report on the North Korean Nuclear Attacks Against the United States. A book I haven't read, but I learned about it while editing this video, so good to know others out there agree with me on this part. And knowing that they can't win a long, drawn-out fight with America, I think North Korea would want to move quickly, perhaps even using weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs, in the opening salvo, in order to knock out South Korean and American forces on the peninsula and occupy it quickly before America can respond. So we see chemical, biological, or even nuclear weapons used in the first moments of the war. Admittedly, North Korea's nuclear arsenal isn't large, with it estimated them having only 20 to 60 nuclear warheads, so my guess is they would use them sparingly to wipe out major enemy concentrations or strategic assets in South Korea, such as port facilities that could be used to offload supplies and reinforcements, although it's not outside the realm of possibility that American military bases in Japan or Guam could be hit as well. Nevertheless, as you can imagine, the death toll from these strikes would be in the millions, and that's assuming America doesn't respond in kind. After the initial strikes, the 1.2 million strong North Korean army will move south. Seoul, a city of almost 10 million people, would be devastated by North Korean rockets and artillery that are within range of the city. Hundreds of thousands of people would die within the first days of the bombardment. Whatever is left of the South Korean military and its American allies are then completely overwhelmed and the rest of the peninsula comes under North Korean occupation. Now the United States is faced with a major dilemma. North Korea is threatening to use its remaining nuclear weapons on American cities unless a new armistice is agreed to. Sure, there is debate over how effective North Korean ICBMs are since they rely on old Soviet hardware, but tell that to a bunch of regular Americans who don't want their families nuked. So what does America do? Do they risk retaliation and rain down nukes on Korea, potentially killing South Koreans and American POWs, while at the same time spreading clouds of radiation toward Japan? 
Or do they commit the forces necessary to liberate Korea, knowing that such deployment will require more soldiers than what was sent during the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan by even the most conservative estimates? Does America admit defeat, or does it commit to a bloody war, even though American civilians could be attacked directly by the enemy? And while all this is happening in the background, you play as an American soldier who survived the initial onslaught, and with the help of your fellow soldiers, rescued by the South Korean resistance, you fight against North Korea. You can still keep the horrors of war in the story, like with the original home front, but this time the South Koreans will have more agency. You'll see them defend their homes instead of becoming part of the bad guys, since in the original home front, it's safe to assume they too made up soldiers of the Korean army occupying America. The thrilling conclusion to the story can involve taking out the base where North Korea is holding its last nuclear weapons and other WMDs. By destroying them, you take away the only deterrent they have preventing an American invasion, thus giving hope to many that the brutal occupation will end. Heck, you can even have the Chinese help out instead of being passive observers like in the original home front. I mean, calling China and North Korea allies may be going too far, as China also doesn't like the idea of the Kim family having nuclear weapons either, much less using them so close to home. So while it's debatable whether they'd intervene directly at this point in the story, they may provide support to take out the rest of North Korea's WMDs if they couldn't secure it for themselves. Of course, this story doesn't really work with the title of home front, but I got that covered. The game will have two playable characters, with part of the game set in America. The other character is a cop, maybe the parent or sibling of the soldier trapped in Korea, working in a small town on the west coast who has to deal with the insanity caused by the second Korean War. Fear of nuclear destruction is causing cities to be abandoned. Anti-Asian racism is widespread as your average bigot is too stupid to realize their Chinese-American neighbor is not a North Korean spy. Meanwhile, survivalists are thinking their long-predicted end times are here and are going out guns a-blazing. To make matters worse, America's digital infrastructure is under attack. We know that North Korea employs thousands of cyber warfare experts, and they would be used in a second Korean War. Cities could suddenly find themselves without power, airports could be shut down, traffic lights could be hijacked, and ransomware could spread across the internet. Cryptocurrency worth millions if not billions would be stolen. That's a lot of apes. Granted, these shutdowns probably wouldn't last long, and America could respond in kind and probably take out North Korea's entire internet, but even a couple days disruption would make life rough for millions of Americans. Authorities would be distracted from putting out so many figurative brush fires that they wouldn't be properly defending their borders. And then, North Korea invades. Okay, a natural ground invasion would be unlikely as North Korea couldn't transport supply a large force across the Pacific. However, I've seen a couple people speculate that it's in the realm of possibility that North Korea could transport elite special forces units by submarine to America. Author Matthew Quinn even suggested to me that they could seize a west coast town and use its people as hostages in order to force America to the negotiating table. North Korea may even up the ante by arming these soldiers with biological and or chemical weapons. And that's where you as the cop character come in. Cut off from any help, you and your allies must fight off the invaders and free the town. And when that is done and North Korea's remaining WMDs are destroyed, the finale rolls with the American president giving a patriotic speech about taking the fight to the enemy, blah blah blah, while clips play of people rebuilding, signing up for the military, fighting back in occupied South Korea, and finally a massive American naval task force streams toward Korea, ready to liberate South Korea and end the Kim dynasty once and for all. And that is my version of Homefront, and yeah, it's implausible in its own way. I really worked hard to find the worst case scenario in my research, but it's still a lot more plausible than the original Homefront, right? The fact of the matter is, a war with North Korea is implausible, and giving them a decade or so to improve doesn't make an invasion of America by them any more realistic. While Homefront did put some effort into their world building, got a couple things about the future right, it even showed how video games can be a medium in dealing with the trauma of war, Homefront is still a contrived, cynical piece of nationalist propaganda without the balls to make China the bad guy, and insults longtime American allies in the process. And while I am biased, there were other ways to tell a more plausible story about war between America and North Korea. Still, if you liked Homefront, then more power to you, but I wasn't impressed. Well, that's it to say in this subject. If you enjoy what I do, please like, comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrovich, the Alternate Historian. Bye.